الخير للجميع Good night to everybody um, I'm honored and thrilled to open the second day of our conference concerning Palestine Israel thinking with Ashim Membe on behalf of the organizing committee of the conference Louis Bethlehem, Matan Kaminer, Ravital Madar and myself I would like to welcome you all to our conference Thank you for your interest and for your participation. Let me first introduce myself briefly, and then I'll introduce the first panelist. I am Arisa Bakhouri. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Hebrew University. I am also a research fellow at Medal Carmel, the Arab Center for the Applied Social Research. My interests are uh, focusing our folk. I am focusing on settler colonialism, uh, leftist Zionism, Palestine, and uh, Israel. A, my recent book, my book will be published soon about the leftist kibbutzim in Marj ibn Amin area from 1936 till 1956. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I want to remind you to keep your microphones on mute. Otherwise, I'll mute you, sorry for that. Unless you have been invited to addressing a question to our panelists, if you would like to offer a question or a comment, please indicate this using the chat function, and I'll then call on you in sequence. Uh, in sequence. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Guy Shalev. Guy is a medical and political anthropologist at the Hebrew University. Martin Buber Society of Fellows. His research concerns the instruction of medical professionalism, ethno-national politics, and bioethics uh, in Israel-Palestine. His research has been published in Culture, Medicine, and Psychiatry. Papers uh, he authored received a number of awards, among them the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association in 2017 and the Society for Medical Anthropology in 2014. Shalev research is funded by, uh, by the NSF and the Dan uh, David Price Scholarship. Uh, Guy will speak about Hungary until freedom the necropolitics of hunger strikes and force feeding in Israeli death wars. Uh, Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me just let's share the screen. Okay, right. you see the presentation, right? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, let me begin. First, I'll say, of course, thank you to the organizers, which is really, I was really impressed and uh, got a lot of, uh, I don't know, political and activist kind of power from just thinking and seeing how you can take such a, an important activism and make it also academic and also vice versa. Uh, so I'll just begin with my talk, uh, which is titled Hungry Until Freedom. Uh, okay. Okay, with, with 800,000 uh, Palestinians detained since the 1967 Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, imprisonment is a lived reality of the Palestinian people. Thousands of incarcerated Palestinian political prisoners have been captivated in administrative detention, where they have been held without trial or charges, captivated as living dead with no anticipated release. Connecting between recent writings in the anthropology of captivity and Mbembe's conceptual conceptualization of necropolitics, I wish to discuss today, one, administrative detention as death world to which Palestinian political prisoners are relegated as living dead, the hunger strike as an act of emancipation, as a nonviolent gradual encounter with the possibility of death, and three, force feeding as the exercise of necro power that in practice aims to keep Palestinians biologically alive but politically dead. Anthropology has been focused in the past two decades on ideas of social neglect, 
meaning critical anthropologists have analyzed how social institutions render individuals and populations dispensable, how disenfranchised and discriminated against populations are denied rights and resources. While this is a valuable perspective, which allowed anthropologists to examine social hierarchies and mechanisms of power, scholars have recently suggested a shift from an anthropology of neglect to an anthropology of captivity. This, this shift inspires three important moves. One, rather than focusing on populations who have been left to die, it urges us to scrap the passive tone and consider who exactly is doing it and how. Two, exploring captivity makes us ask who is kept captive and where. This makes us much more attentive to questions of scale, to consider individuals, but also entire populations in captivity. And three, what do we do about it? Focusing on abandonment calls for a philosophy of witnessing, Agamben as the perfect example, or uh, politics of solidarity, according to which we need to acknowledge the unacknowledged. But if we address captivity, then recognizing those held captive is not enough. It calls for escape, for liberation. And this is where Mbembe's necropolitics comes in, a powerful, comes in as a powerful conceptualization of this shift. From a narrow view of biopolitics, as let die and make live, the acknowledging, uh, to acknowledging the proactive mechanisms of su subjugating life to the power of death. Doing an anthropology of captivity in Palestine, Israel, requires us to consider issues of scale. The Israeli secular colonial regime holds the Palestinian indigenous population in a multi-layered system of captivity, a captivity of, of an entire nation. Administrative detention is but the harshest form of captivity in a layered system of Israeli-made death wounds in which colonized Palestinians are relegated to varied zones between subjecthood and ob objecthood, to use the Mbembe's words, page 79 in Necropolitics. Millions of Palestinians and their descendants are captivated stateless in precarious status and in refugee camps since the 1948 Palestinian Nakba. Others who remained in Palestine are either captivated in the largest open-air prison of the besieged Gaza Strip or under Israeli martial law in the West Bank. Within this layered reality of confinement, administrative detainees are at the very end of the spectrum of captivity. They are held without trial by power of a military commander who consider it to quote, necessitated by security considerations. The process is entirely classified and detainees and their lawyers do not even know what the allegations are. These are most commonly allegations that a person plans to commit a future offense. While the maximum period of each single order cannot exceed six months, it can be extended indefinitely. In many cases, on the eve of its expiration. Ex expiration. Leaving the detainees in constant despair, a cruel game of yes hope, no hope, to quote uh, one detainee reported to see here. In Mbembe's words, administrative detention is a Zionist-made death war in which Palestinians are subjugated to living conditions that confer upon them the status of the living dead. In my study, I asked, how has the hunger-striking detainee, the one at the very bottom, came to symbolize freedom for an entire captivated nation? The Sleeping Thousand, this is just uh, two examples, one from 1992 and one from 2012 of how hunger strike lights and sparks uh, Palestinian uh, resistance. The Sleeping Thousand is a recently premiered opera uh, about a massive hunger strike in Israeli prisons, right by Jonathan Levy. In the opera, the Israeli prime minister asks S, the head of the Shin Bet, what about the hunger strike of the thousand Arab administrative detainees? S replied, the emptiness in their intestines deepens, and they are determined to dig within it a shaft of freedom for their people. Hunger strikes have been a mean for Palestinian political prisoners to dig a shaft of freedom for their people. Palestinian prisoners resorted to hunger strikes since 1968, with major strikes in 72, 80, 84, 86, 92, 98, 2000, 2004. General strikes in 2012 of 1,600 prisoners in 2017, 1,100 prisoners, Mark this practice particularly central to the Palestinian struggle in recent years. Most importantly, this has been a practice used by administrative detainees as the last resort 
after all other forms of struggle and protest against injustice have been exhausted. Captivated in limbo, incarcerated with no anticipated release, without ever knowing the allegation against them, administrative detainees are at rock bottom. For Gregory Bateson, in 1971, the idea of hitting rock bottom, the lowest possible level, uh, is a moment of revelation. It is then when a person realizes she has no control. Within the layered confinement of the Palestinian people, it is those at the bottom in the death world of administrative detention who truly realize the lack of control inherent to the position of the captive. Bateson argues that this moment of revelation is also the moment of transformation, of liberation. For Palestinian hunger strikers, it is the body that is subjected to confinement, but also the key for liberation. Mbembe's analysis of martyrdom is particularly, particularly useful to understand this dialectic. In martyrdom, the Shahid's body becomes a weapon. Resistance and self-destruction becomes one, in page 89. The martyr's encounter with death is emancipation. To quote Mbembe's book on page 90, the besieged body becomes a piece of metal whose function is to bring eternal life into being into being through sacrifice. The body duplicates itself and in death, literally and metaphorically, escapes the state of siege and occupation. A hunger strike, much like martyrdom, is a weaponization of the body. As Mbembe points out, the body in itself has neither power nor value. But with the gradual approach of death, the hunger striker signals that he is or she is in the process of overcoming her own mortality. It is a non-violent, gradual encounter with the possibility of death. The, the hunger striker is a shaheed in the making, and his death will load his starving body with ultimate signification. Throughout uh, the day... Okay. Two minutes. Okay, it's enough for me. Uh, throughout the decades of military occupation, the Israeli state mastered a plethora of oppressive and violent means to suppress the Palestinian struggle. However, it wrestled with how to crush this despondent act of resistance. As in Levy's opera, and they cannot be put on trial, and they cannot be set free, and they cannot be left to die. Gilad Erdan, the Israeli, Prime, the Israeli Minister for Public Security, said in 2015, security prisoners are interested in turning a hunger strike into a new type of suicide terrorist attempt through which they will threaten the state of Israel. We will not allow anyone to threaten us, and we will not allow prisoners to die in our prison. In Levy's opera, as the detainees' health deteriorates and international pressure grows, the Israeli prime minister struggles to find a way out. He consults again with S, the head of the Shin Bet, who says, we must put them to sleep, keep them in a coma, and presents a threefold argument. Deny their physical freedom by means of unrelease, deny their mental freedom by means of untrial, deny their spiritual freedom by means of undeath. In reality, as in the Sleeping Thousand opera, Israel turned to the medical community for help. But rather than the phantasmal idea of putting the hunger strikers to sleep, the Israeli government instructed physicians to force feed the detainees. After a long struggle, the Israeli parliament legislated the 2015 force feeding act. Arguably, Force feeding hunger strikers complies with the fictional Shin Bet threefold argument. It denies their phys physical freedom by means of unrelease, it denies their mental freedom by means of untrial, and it denies their spiritual freedom by means of undeath. By forcefully keeping Palestinians alive, Israel has exerted the ultimate necro power. At the peak of Palestinian hunger strikes between 2012 and 2015, the number of administrative detainees dropped from 500 to 100. Detainees found a way out of the death world of administration, administrative detention. They dug a shift, a shaft of freedom for themselves and for their people. However, the legalization of force feeding further, forti further fortified uh, this death world. And since 2015, the number of administrative detainees quickly climbed to the pre-2012 uh, period. Introducing force feeding crushed detainees' only possible act of self-control and their last resort for political protests. 
in practice, the exertion of this necropower meant keeping Palestinians biologically alive, but politically dead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Guy. Shukran. Uh, our uh, next speaker is Osama. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, our next speaker is Osama Tanmos. Osama is a specialized pediatrician based in Haifa and clinical instructor in the Rappaport Faculty of Medicine in the Tachnion. He is currently pursuing his Master of Public Health in Tel Aviv University and is a researcher at the Galil Society, the Arab National Society for Health Research and Services. He is the 2000 2020 Fulbright Herbert Humphrey Fellow in Public Health and Health uh, Policies. His research interests include structural violence and health disparities. Uh, Osama will talk about between the production of ease, disease, and death, the spectrum of necropolitics. Osama, tfaddal, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Arij, and thank you for the organizers and the audience. I will share my screen, so just a moment. Okay. So, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so I will start. A, okay, so I will try to discuss the production of ease, disease, and death, the spectrum of necropolitics from a medical and public health uh, perspective. Uh, okay. In 1845, uh, Engels, uh, Frederick Engels published uh, The Conditions of the Working Class in England. Uh, where he discussed uh, the difference between an individual manslaughter versus the social war, which uh, he defined as when society uh, puts the proletariat and the working class in a position where they meet a too early and unnatural death, uh, when it deprives the thousands of workers from the, uh, from the decent conditions of life and forces them to stay in these uh, conditions to meet an early and premature death. Uh, he, def he discussed the difference between murder by omission versus murder by commission. Okay, uh, these uh, charts that uh, Engels made were one of the on uh, first charts in public health where we can see the change in society from agricultural society living in the countryside to uh, in the bottom leads uh, industrial society where people are squeezed in small uh, houses and small working places. And here we can see the mortality rate of kids under the age of five per 10,000. So they have almost doubled from these condition, uh, conditions engineered by the state and by the capital class. Um, in 1848, uh, Rudolf Velkorv, one of the uh, a pioneer German doctor and one of the founding fathers of public health, uh, was sent by the state to Upper Schlesia, uh, an, a poor uh, uh, farmer's region between Germany and Poland to explore the typhoid uh, uh, epidemic uh, then. Uh, his conclusion was that the feudal system has created the wretched conditions of the peasants and transformed them uh, into uh, basically machines for other. His suggested medical and radical solution was full citizenship with destruction of the old structure of the state and redistribution of wealth, power, and land. And while Mbembe discussed politics as the work of debt or a warlike relation par excellence, Verkov discussed politics as nothing else but medicine on a large scale. He continued to say that medicine is a social science and uh, as the science of the human being, it has the obligation to point out to the problems and to attempt to their theoretical solutions, whereas the politician, the practical anthropologist might find the, uh, the means to their actual solution. In 2003, Mbembe asked who is allowed to live, who, ex who is exposed to death, and who must die as a question of sovereignty. And how is life, death, and the human body inscribed in these orders of power? And he questions uh, what uh, the good life is all about, how to achieve it, and how in the process to become fully moral. 
He discussed sovereignty as the right to kill, the material destruction of human bodies and population. Now we will see how this can manifest. How, uh, how does this killing operate and manifest? And what is the relationship between politics and the, um, uh, of the fictionized enemy in a system of emergency? And here I will try to stretch it to not only uh, the enemy, but other uh, societies in different hierarchies. So uh, what can a medical doctor contribute to uh, the discussion on the spectrum of necropolitics between ease, disease, and death, the right to live and the right to kill? I will try to uh, stretch Mbembe's question not only to death, but to the spectrum between ease, disease, and death, to the distribution of health, disease, disability, and death between uh, populations, not only enemy populations, but also among uh, racial and class hierarchies. Enemies uh, can take different forms in settler colonial projects. Uh, and if we would uh, direct our medical gaze at the distribution between health and the disease, uh, the distribution that is not theatrical or shocking, but rather hidden in the statistics and reports of health disparities of the conditions that can create such a, such a graph where we can see, for example, Cameroon, where Ashil Mbembe comes from, where people live an average life expectancy of 60 versus wealthy nations of the global north that live to an average expectancy of 85. Uh, if we would uh, build on the Foucault notion of biopower and the split between life and death, between who must live and who must die, I will try to ask who will die from what and in what age, and how, how is health, disease, and disability unequally distributed along the racial class lines. So here we can see the life expectancy or the uh, median age of death for a Jewish population in Israel versus a Palestinian population in Israel, a Palestinian population in the West Bank, and a Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip. And we can see the numbers falling gradually while thinking about what are the conditions that have produced these uh, you know, statistics and uh, numbers. Despite the tightly bound relationship between politics and health, our imagination of the political violence, or in other uh, cases murder, is often limited to the extreme or theatrical, to bombing, shooting, and sudden displacement. Yet, if we, uh, in a chronic ongoing settler colonial project, if we uh, people mostly die an early, premature, and preventable death, not necessarily from direct killing or murder, but from an engineered machinery of domination and suppression of hierarchies of accesses or denial of accesses to healthcare. So if we would look at what are the main causes of death in the occupied Palestinian territory, we can say that the main causes are uh, heart diseases, uh, cancer, uh, blood, uh, blood vessel diseases, diabetes, while accidents, including uh, colonial shooting and violence, only takes 4% of the cases. If we, here we can see the mortality rate in Palestinian towns in Israel, uh, like overall mortality rate. This is a necropolitics par excellence. So while the average national average, including the Palestinian population is 4.9, different Palestinian cities have almost doubled the national average of mortality rates. Uh, so uh, impoverished and marginalized places like just Zarqa, Laqiyye, have almost doubled that of the uh, average uh, or uh, national, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the national average. And if we look at uh, the average mortality from heart diseases, and these are largely considered uh, preventable because in our age, people should not die from heart attacks and heart diseases in such great numbers because we have excellent uh, medications for them. So we can see also for many of the Palestinian towns inside Israel, it's almost double the number of the national average. This is necropolitics par excellence. And while Mbembe discussed race and racism as the imagination of the inhumanity of the foreign people, uh, the public health literature uh, defines uh, racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on, the, uh, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which we call race. And this unfairly advantages other uh, individuals and communities and, uh, and creates a waste of the human resources. 
So it is exploitative and express, uh, oppressive social relations that benefits the dominant group and harms the, uh, the marginalized groups. It does not have a biological value. Uh, and here uh, we have the eco-social theory uh, proposed by Nancy Krieger, a, um, a social epidemiologist in, 19, in the mid 90s, uh, where we can see uh, the different conditions that uh, create the, uh, the spectrum of health and disease, starting from social trauma, to uh, economical and social, social deprivation, to exposure to toxins, to degradation of uh, the ecosystem and land alienation in the indigenous uh, or uh, occupied uh, communities, to discrimination in adequate medical care, and so on. All of that create a vicious cycle that, uh, that leads to a premature and early and unnecessary death. And, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, two minutes. Okay, and while uh, largely these groups, uh, racialized groups have been uh, blamed for their own diseases while having their behaviors, beliefs, and biologies being inferior, another kind of viscerality, uh, new medical data shows us how, uh, how discrimination and racism infiltrate our bodies and cell. Here we can see an activation of the uh, stress release hormones and how uh, studies of women that uh, Latino women in the USA that were exposed to racism expressed more and more stress hormones and genes that uh, you know led to uh, 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 to certain kinds of diseases and here we can see how racism actually penetrates our DNA not to change it but to uh, to accelerate biological aging among African American uh, men and truly lead to a premature and early death. In Palestine, all of the above uh, mentioned conditions operate in, a, 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 in a, operate in various ways and speed to design the environment that we live in. This is Imam Faham. Uh, and such environments that, of course, uh, do not lead to a healthy lifestyle, to the uh, shortage of uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene, uh, to the militarization of space. So these structural arrangements contribute to the butcher bell of death, to shortened and disabled life and avoidable and preventable miseries, all of which goes largely unnoticed and considered often natural death. Uh, Uh, so as the settler project continues to expand, claiming new territories and sovereignty, even now with the annexations on the head, it squeezes and engineers an ever-shrinking and degraded built environment for the native. Such fragmented enclaves become the dumping ground of the indisposed of and yet recycled waste of the frontier land by Bauman. In the intersection of settler colonialism, uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, and militarization, the labor and the consumption of the native also becomes neglectable. They become surplus population to be surveilled, ignored, and disappear slowly while dying uh, slowly and prematurely, but often considered naturally dead. Thank you. Shukran, Osama. Thank you, Osama, for wonderful uh, talk. Okay. Uh, our last, spe last speaker for this panel is Gala Rixer. Gala is a feminist scholar, activist, and writer pursuing a PhD in sociology at Humboldt University in Berlin. She was an academic curator of a three-part interdisciplinary sy symposium on technology, gender, and sexuality entitled Interrupted, Saifim, and Queer. Rixer is a member of Differcat, Center for Theoretical Periphery in Berlin, and a fellow of Heinrich Bell Foundation. Her research has been published in Comparative Sociology and Ethnic and Racial Studies forthcoming, and her interests materialized at the intersection of bodies, borders, reproduction, and sexuality. Rixer will talk about making live, letting die, or foreclosing birth, interrogating the Israeli settler colonial fertility economy. Uh, Gala, the floor is yours. Totally. Yeah. I will share my screen with you. Okay. 
First of all, um, thank you to the organizing committee from Academia for Equality for organizing this amazing symposium and to all the other speakers sharing their research, research and knowledge with us today and yesterday. Um, as my title suggests, in this paper today, I will think with Achille Mbembe, Michel Foucault and Lauren Berlant about bodies and how the right to be born is distributed differently according to nation states' interests in what Anne Stoller has termed the colonial or settler colonial order of things. The argument that I'm trying to make today in this short presentation is that Palestinian women's experiences in trying to get pregnant in Israeli medical spaces reveals on a theoretical level how the concepts of bio and Negro politics have to be understood as a theoretical pair to think with when addressing reproduction in the settler colonial context. Both notions, bio and Negro politics, derive from thinking about the sovereignty in managing life and death. And I will investigate how the beginning of life, the making of life, in a settler colonial context such as Israel, Palestine is equally applicable to other contexts such as the US or Canada or Australia is of interest in these imperial formations. Um, can, can you see me? Can you see the slides? Yes, yes. we can. Yes, we can. Like, like there was a... Okay. More specifically, facilitating or complicating access to reproduction, and in the case of this paper, access to assisted reproduction and fertility clinics, can be understood as a function of the settler colonial state, which aims at regulating its population, sexuality, and reproductive behavior according to an internal logic of minimizing the population of certain groups. As scholars such as Sigrid Fertoman or Michal Naman have discussed, Although Israel is one of the most liberal countries worldwide regarding policies of assisted reproduction, Israel's pronatalism is best described as selective and stratified. The settler colonial interpolation of the population in Israel-Palestine through a settler native or a settler indigenous dichotomy in regards to who shall reproduce the nation reflects in demographic policies. And even more so, I hope to illustrate in the following, it effectively structures Israeli medical space. In order to address how bio and necropolitics come into play as a theoretical pair, I would like to add Lauren Berlant's notion of slow death. The phrase slow death refers to the physical wearing out of a population in a way that points to its deterioration as a defining condition of its experience and historical existence. So by referring to the physical wearing out the deterioration of a population, slow death as a conceptual tool will help to understand how in making live and letting die, the foreclosing of birth originates between a productive seizure of bodies on the one hand and the letting die of a population by governing them according to settler colonial demographic policies and affects on the other. Thinking about reproduction, letting die of a population translates into processes of actively or more self at least, as we will see, discouraging or hindering that population from reproducing. So I will walk you through some interview extracts now. I have conducted these interviews together with my interpreter Najla Fawaz as part of my research of the last three years. In these two first quotes, both by women in their 20s, one of them from East Jerusalem and the other one from Haifa, the productive seizure of bodies in a biopolitical sense is felt. Both speak about who is encouraged to reproduce in Israel-Palestine and as a result, who is not. I feel like Orthodox Jews reproduce because they want us to leave and they stay here. So we don't even have chances. They have kids because the Jewish government provides them like they don't work and have no income. We're living in a state that considers itself not ours. So we will always be a second degree. We live together, we're able to have education, we share life with them, but the Israeli child will always be the priority. So now we're having a closer look at what is happening in the Israeli medical space. In this example, a 42 years old woman from East Jerusalem reflects upon an ultrasound she was receiving as part of her fertility treatment. 
She had been with different nurses before and recounts how with one specific Jewish Israeli nurse, this very like usual standard procedure caused her a lot of pain, which she ascribed to this nurse's microaggressions towards her. The thing was so different, so different. Even the pain is different. I felt the pain so severely with her. Even if you come and you're Israeli, she smiles at you and says good morning. But if you're an Arab, she does not look at you. It's that kind of discrimination. I can see how she acts with the others. So bio-necropolitical management of bodies in Israel-Palestine and how it reflects in microaggressions and language barriers. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, uh, so, talking about language, a lot of women, especially those living in East Jerusalem, recounted that they had difficulties in the Israeli hospital due to the main language there being Hebrew. So, although some would come with someone who speaks Hebrew and some doctors would speak Arabic or at least know some basic terms about the fertility treatment, the language barrier was often also a barrier in becoming pregnant. This reflects in the following quote. I would take the wrong medications, which would affect me, and I would stop the treatment. That's a problem for me. Like, I would stop medications just because I don't understand them, which makes it complicated. I don't understand the words. Now, bio and necropolitical management of bodies in Israel-Palestine and how it reflects in microaggressions and language barriers and many other factors I can't discuss in this short presentation is being internalized by Palestinian women. And we've heard about this internalization of borders or oppression in um, presentations yesterday. So here in this quote, a Palestinian doctor reflects on her patients in the delivery room and the fertility department. When Arabs come into a Jewish hospital, they take it maybe like, I can't ask for anything, so I have to be very good because I'm not in my territory. The occupation here is felt on a spatial and bodily level and translates into how safe these women feel in asking for help, information, or voice their concerns. And this, in turn, obviously affects the outcome of their fertility treatment. This lack of trust in the settler colonial medical space is voiced in the second example here, a 41-year-old woman from East Jerusalem. She says, if we want to speak again about the trust, the racism plays inside you so that you, you keep on saying, is what she is saying true? And she being a fertility doctor here. Which means I don't know whom to listen to. I could go undertake an exam with the Arab doctors just to make sure. As these few examples have illustrated, the bio and necropolitics of the Israeli fertility economy have their effect on Palestinian women and their reproductive practices. A situation in which the birth of their children is openly and in more subtle ways discouraged, while the birth of Jewish Israelis actively encouraged, affects them. This is obviously enhanced by the general situation of living under occupation and the resulting lack of resources, resources and we have heard many iterations thereof in the last uh, few presentations. So we can see this in these two last quotes. The situation here doesn't encourage us to get pregnant and give birth to children. The political situation is scary and plays a big role in this. Like you would count to a thousand before getting pregnant, says a 25 year old woman from a refugee camp next to Jerusalem. In our Palestinian community, we don't think like we want to outnumber Jews. We think we can't raise more than two kids because life is hard and it's very expensive. By bringing in the concept of slow death, the destructive aspect of necropolitical management of bodies becomes more tangible in not, not in letting die, but in foreclosing birth. By wearing out Palestinian women economically, structurally, and on an effective bodily level. Um, and as we saw in this um, slide, they will think a thousand times before they will get pregnant. So to close, I would like to read this quote by Mbembe. Um, in this case, sovereignty means the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not. And I hope I have um, contributed to illustrating who shall be born and who shall not in this framework.
And next to it, you see a picture of a, an Israeli hospital, and you see in which languages the delivery room sign is written. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gala. Thank you, Osama. And thank you, Guy, for such a wonderful and illuminating uh, uh, talks. Palestinians. Uh, through these trials, I examine how the Israeli legal system sets out the legitimate and non-legitimate violence and the Israeli state negotiates and how the Israeli state negotiates these limits. So our first speaker uh, is Liron Moore, an assistant professor of comparative literature at the University of California, Irvine, affiliated with the program in critical, in critical theory, global Middle East studies and Jewish studies. She was awarded the Anne Tannenbaum Postdoctoral Fellowship by the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto, Canada, and the Andrew Mellon Graduate Fellowship by Cornell Society for the Humanities. Her research and teaching focuses on the contemporary Israeli and Palestinian literature and film, Mizrahi culture and thought, critical and political theory, law and coloniality and questions of translation, representation and political relations under unequal conditions. She has published articles in Arab Studies Journal, Comparative Literature and Mafteh. Her talk is entitled Uncomparison. Please, you're on. Um, thank you, um, everyone. And thank you, um, Ravital, and thanks to all the organizers and the contributors. Um, this has been such a, an eye-opening uh, conference um, and also just a really nice opportunity to interact with all of you um, outside of the umbrella of uh, official Israeli institutions. So I personally am looking forward to more events like this one. Um, my talk today is intended to offer some initial thoughts about the practice of comparison itself. Um, I basically thought that the recent scandal around the Shilm Bemba's comparison of the Palestinian context to um, apartheid South Africa um, was a good opportunity to look into this business of comparison uh, once more. And so um, in a paraphrase of a famous cliche by Tolstoy, um, it sometimes seems as though all happy regimes are alike, while each unhappy regime is unhappy in its own way. Um, this reference is not meant to suggest that all relatively uh, stable regimes are indeed exactly the same. Um, what I propose rather is that comparing such happy regimes um, to one another or using the same categories to denote their various forms is rarely contested. The term democracy, for instance, names the forms of numerous and strikingly different forms of government. Um, while an adjective or a modifier is sometimes used um, and added to the word democracy in order to account for the nuances of this or that democracy. So we might talk about liberal democracy, we might talk about totalitarian democracy, but nonetheless, we're still talking about democracy and the widespread use of the term um, is an established convention. So if I were to now say that, you know, um, France uh, is a democracy, chances are that no one's going to rush in and object that uh, the term democracy is historically inaccurate because the French form of democracy is not exactly the same as the democracy that was practiced in ancient Athens. As we know, however, uh, the situation is vastly different in the case of unhappy regimes or of less flattering comparisons. So in the context of Palestine, Israel, as the recent outrage Bembe's comparison demonstrates um, certain analogic terms like settler colonialism, genocide, or apartheid immediately inspire dissent and objections. And those objections are often rooted in claims regarding the historical inaccuracy of the comparison. So this claim that this is not exactly the same as South Africa. So in Unhappy Israel, the exhortation to never compare has become a kind of secular commandment of sorts. And this is particularly true with the category of genocide. Uh, the Zionist exceptionalism is widely acknowledged in academic scholarship, and this is so much so that um, comparative projects, um, such as settler colonial studies, for instance, are seen as ipso facto, kind of radically challenging Zionism. At the same time, however, the Israeli state itself utilizes comparisons when those suit its interests, 
So for instance, the Israeli government has repeatedly analogized um, Palestinian refugees and displaced Muslim Jews in hope that the comparison will include the political, economic, and cultural demands of both groups. And by so doing, will also obliterate the state's obligations to both of them. Um, so with regards to comparison, it kind, of, it kind of seems like we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. Um, and what I would suggest at this point is that the question itself needs to be reframed. So it should no longer be whether or not to compare, but rather how to compare and how to do so both effectively and responsibly. So as a beginning of an answer to this question, um, I suggest a very short etymological digression. And you know, as, as a comparative literature person, we kind of do that a lot, so bear with me. Um, the Hebrew word for comparison, uh, hashva'a, exposes some of the issues at stake. Um, it signifies both uh, comparison, right, comparing and contrasting, and equalizing, that is putting things on the same, on equal footings. Um, in its double denotation, Hashva'a reminds us that any comparison is always in danger of completely equating the conditions of both terms, um, of putting them on par with each other, which is quite literally what the English word compare means. Um, so if we envision comparison as a kind of overlaying of objects one on top of the other, then um, comparison always risks eliminating from view all those aspects of its objects that do not perfectly overlap, that kind of sticks out a little bit. Um, the Arabic word for comparison, karana, reminds us that to compare is first of all to connect or to associate. Um, its root, however, also raises the specter of the blurred line between associate and enemy, friend and foe, since both are encapsulated in the notion of a peer or a match um, of an equal in battle to which this word is etymologically related. So while comparison has a great associating power, and it may, for instance, garner support for a political cause, it also risks highlighting similarities at the expense of vital local differences. So beginning with these um, etymological insights, I want to look at um, Bembe's analogies and see what we might learn about comparison from them. Um, what forms of association or solidarity does his comparison yield? So in Society of Amity, um, Bemba claimed, and by now all too famously, that in many respects, Israeli practices in Palestine, quote, recall the revived model of apartheid, end quote. So a comparison. But then three lines down, he already qualifies this comparison and argues that, and I'm quoting, the metaphor of apartheid does not fully account for the specific character of the Israeli separation project, end quote. Um, and he explained that this is the case because of Zionism's um, theological qualities, because of its high-tech infrastructure, because of its less intimate dependence on indigenous labor, and because of its ability to transform itself into an instrument of strangulation, which is kind of unique. Um, so what is specific about this form of comparison that we see here with Bembe? Um, first of all, it is not intended to level off differences. Instead, Bembe compares while contrasting, while pointing out the fundamental differences between the two things that he is comparing. Second, this comparison challenges the status quo instead of merely affirming existing conditions. Um, if we take my earlier example, for instance, um, Israel's comparison between displaced Mizrahi Jews and Palestinian refugees, um, that, then we can see that this kind of comparison, the way that the Israeli state performs it, equalizes the conditions of both groups and that by doing that it supports the status quo the um, hegemonic israeli discourse that frames the conditions in palestine and israel as a territorial dispute between two equal adversaries um, the part on the other hand um, let the comparison implied instead of colonial studies, for instance, um, reorients the discussion away from the symmetrical model and toward um, the results of Israel's policies and actions on the ground. And by doing that, it highlights the structurally unequal political and moral standings of the two parties. Um, moreover, undermine, undermining Israel's claim for exceptionalism, this comparison metonymically associates the Palestinian case with other um, indigenous struggles around the world that might be less contentious. Um, and by so doing, it offers a kind of translation that makes the Palestinian case more legible and more accessible. And so it generates international solidarity and support for the Palestinian cause. Finally, this practice of comparison that we see with Bembe not only calls attention to its own failure to capture the situation in its entirety, 
it also attempts to face up to this failure by elaborating further and further. So in Bembe's writing, this elaboration takes on the form of listing, um, adding more and more theoretical frames. For instance, um, he opens his Society of Enmity, the, um, the essay that recently got him in trouble, by describing um, the desire for an enemy as, quoting, the desire for apartheid, for separation and enclosure, the fantasy of extermination. Um, so it becomes a list. Um, and when he discusses Palestine in this essay, as well as in Necropolitics and in his preface to the book, um, Apartheid Israel, he describes the conditions in Palestine as apartheid, as an extractive laboratory, as genocide, as siege, and even as similar to Jim Crow and to slavery as a form of death in life. And this has been mentioned um, throughout the- Sorry for interrupting, just two minutes. Okay. Um, in retrospect, we can also add one more uh, model to this list, and that is um, just Pierre Poir's more recent articulation of the biopolitical technology of maiming is one which triangulates the necropolitical focus of life and death. And we've heard about that um, from Michael yesterday and from um, Osama today. Um, so why does Bembe offer an entire list of comparative analogies? Um, why does he need this long catalog of theoretical frameworks to talk about Palestine and Israel? Uh, the main problem with the different available and mostly um, important models is that neither covers all of the important aspects of the Palestinian case. Um, and one might object here and say this is in fact the case with every comparison, that it never fully captures all of the nuances of the target case. And this is perfectly true. Um, however, in the context of Palestine, the problem is in, this problem is intertwined with yet another problem, which is that each of the existing analogical models, genocide, apartheid, colonialism, settler colonialism, even slavery, um, is helpful in representing the condition of only one segment of the Palestinian population. So it might um, apply to um, Palestinians in the diaspora, or it might apply to the West Bank, or it might apply to uh, Palestinians of the inside, or, um, 948 Palestinians, but each of these analogical frameworks divides up Palestinian society along the same divide and conquer lines, the same colonial lines of internal division um, that were drawn in 1948 um, by Israel. By way of conclusion, um, I would like to point out two short lessons that we might draw from Bempe's lists. First, um, is that this practice of comparison exposes the fact that Israeli sovereignty and its apparatuses are a tangled hodgepodge of forms, techniques, and technologies. Um, my wager is that combinatory form is very much intentional. Um, it both contributes to the splintering of Palestinian society that I've just mentioned, but it also guarantees its own endurance, its own open-endedness. Um, if we don't know how to name a problem, if we cannot give it a single name, it becomes so much harder to find a solution for it, right? Um, the second lesson is that Bebe's need to list also highlights the fact that um, the specific conditions of Palestine and of uh, Palestinians have not yet been studied enough for their own particularity to appear, um, and perhaps even to appear under its own particular name. So on the one hand, yes, we need to maintain the potential for comparisons, and so we need um, we need the, the widest possible theoretical framework. Um, and I would suggest here something like colonialism. But at the same time, and on the other hand, um, there's also a need for some kind of a modifier or an adjective. Like when I mentioned democracy, I mentioned the possibility of talking about liberal democ democracy, for instance. So we need some kind of um, descriptor that will bring out, will the Palestinian days. Um, okay, I will end here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Liron. Um, our second speaker is Salim Rauer, uh, who, who was a research fellow and junior faculty at the Vidal Sasson International Center for the Study of Antisemitism at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His work examines the territorialities of foreignness as well as traumatic and post traumatic memories related to colonialism and the Shoah in French and Francophone contemporary literature and drama. He is the author of a novel, La Passion de Pierre, a biographical essay, Freddie Mercury, 
and several collections of poems, among them Landscape and Le Sable et le Couton. He has published in various literary and academic peer-reviewed journals, such as La Règle de Jeu, African Culture, and more recently, La Revue Littéraire, Modern Drama and Research in African Literature. He will discuss power of domination versus power of existence, life and death in the work and thought of Achille Mbembe. Please, Salim. Uh, Revital, thank you very much for uh, the very warm welcoming and uh, for making this uh, uh, very easy uh, for me to, uh, to access. Uh, the last days have been pretty complicated, as, as you know. I also wanted to uh, thank very much uh, the organizers of uh, this symposium and especially uh, Louise, who has been uh, uh, in close contact and with whom I had uh, uh, a lot of wonderful exchanges during my time in, in Jerusalem. So uh, thank you all for... Uh, uh, for being part of it, um, I, I, I wanted to um, to discuss here something um, related to the nature of the language uh, and how language has been distorted or manipulated um, within very specific ideological frames, uh, uh, frames that have a lot of consequences actually, um, and uh, at the moment when Ashin Membe was uh, uh, denounced as having uh, anti-Semitic thoughts or, or comments and doing uh, a parallelism between uh, 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 the situation of the Palestinian people uh, uh, in, in Gaza, in the West Bank or Israel and, and the apartheid state uh, that prevailed in, in South Africa. And so this in his book, Necropolitics. So this, this comment came from uh, the, spokesperson, spokesperson of, uh, uh, the spokesperson for cultural policy of the German Liberal Democratic Party, the, the FDP, uh, in, the, in the parliamentary group in the North Rhine-Westphalia Parliament. Uh, and this has been followed also, this comment, uh, this attack has been followed by the, the, the federal government commissioner for the fight against anti-Semitism, Felix Klein. Um, so we should have a, just a, um, maybe it has already been mentioned before, but uh, uh, have a close look to uh, what uh, Ashin Maybe precisely says. And he writes in Necropolitics, I quote, as it happens, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories serves as a laboratory for a number of techniques of control, surveillance and separation that are today proliferating in other places on the planet. These techniques range from the regular sealing off of entire areas to restricting the number of Palestinians allowed to enter Israel and the occupied territories from the repeated imposition of curfews within Palestinian enclaves and control on movement to the objective imprisonment of entire towns. And he adds further uh, by the end uh, uh, of uh, this passage, such practices, I quote, such practices variously recall the revealed model of apartheid uh, with its bantu stands, vast reservoirs of cheap labor, its white zones, its multiple jurisdiction and wanton violence. However, the metaphor of apartheid does not fully account for the specific character of the Israeli separation project. First, this project rests on a rather singular metaphysical and existential base. The apocalyptic and catastrophic resources underwriting it are far more complex and derive from a longer historical horizon than those that made South African Calvinism possible. So, and I would like to come back to this uh, uh, metaphysical element uh, uh, that Ashim Mbembe uh, points out. But before, um, I would like to mention uh, the way uh, uh, the, the way Mbembe's critic is uh, uh, has been handled. So he's. Uh, this critic is assuaged at the end of a development that hasn't been fully considered by his detractors. Hence, his examination of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict seems to have been taken out of context and uh, uh, in order to create a kind of intellectual disqualification by way of an alleged anti-Semitic thought, denunciation essentially shaped to damage the scholar's legitimacy. In addition to the following aspect, I would like to add that uh, every single dimension highlighted by Membe prior to his reservation at the end of this passage on the account of parallel drawings between the former South African apartheid st state and current logics of discriminations and violences exerted by the actual Israeli government over Palestinian citizens, uh, 
through its army and police is nothing else but accurate. Uh, the current Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, like several members of his consecutive governments so over the past 10 years, have systematically attempted to counterattack critics by defaming or qualifying any condemnation of their colonization policies as anti Semitic. It is an attempt to delegitimize forthright any kind of criticism and to congeal any scrutinization of the Israeli Palestinian conflict or even to reroute it in a different direction and to create more confusion. If the attempt at isolationism decreed by the Israeli military staff appeared in the 1990s as an attempt to prevent any form of uh, terrorist threat calling for the liberation of Palestine, this logic escalated towards a higher degree of physical and psychological control by a repressive military state and police forces over part of its population, uh, the Israeli Arabs and an entire Palestinian population secluded in disparate territories or enclaves within the actual state of Israel. Systematic controls, prejudices, humiliations, threats, and marginalization are commonplaces. As Edouard Said already stated it during the period marked by the first uh, Intifada, between 1987 and 1993, the violence exerted by the Israeli state on part of the Palestinian population was uh, at that time uh, considered as justified, legitimate, decent, or moral. And the dynamic at work here, the one which makes it possible to attack with such virulence and to an institutional degree, a scholar and post colonial thinker such as Membe is that which was theorized between the 1920s and 30s by the Italian philosopher and activist Antonio Gramsci through his forged notion of cultural hegemony. So this is something that makes it possible to move into the ideological struggle from a discursive face to a certain legitimized uh, or not practice of power and its exercise over a population. So it is no longer here a question of demonstrating to what extent speech can be performative or even if uh, of illustrating or arguments can be constructed to undo any denunciation of a policy based on authoritarianism and nationalism, which as maybe himself reminds us with the Israeli case is differently structured compared to other national imaginary frameworks such as the right-wing populism or proto-fascisms existing at the present time in the United States, Hungary or Brazil, whose current governments form, by the way, so many allies of Netanyahu. So this nationalist imaginary in Israel is also constituted around a national uh, theology or political theology acting in a certain in certain cases at the level of the cultural unconscious and constituting itself around metaphysical effects sensitivities which touch on the transcendence of identity inscribed in a geography in a territoriality and in a traumatic and post-traumatic chains of causalities linked to the diasporic and exilic experiences to the Shoah and to various wars and conflicts faced by the Hebrew state and its neighboring Arab countries following the founding of Israel in 1948. Overly said, this nationalism is also based on a certain experience and definition of traumatic and post-traumatic memories as they have been defined by Katika Ruth, in, uh, for instance, in, in Clem Experience, or as a transgenerational traumatic memories as articulated by Mira Atkinson. In such a framework, the attempt to discredit and trivialize the accusation of anti-Semitism is not only a particularly dangerous setback when it becomes a bulwark behind which one seeks to hide the violence and crimes of a colonization policy but does not dare to say its name, but also a fundamental problem for the Israelis themselves as well as the members of the Jewish diasporas identifying themselves or not with the courses taken by the state of Israel precisely because of the profound cultural and essentialization dynamics of anti-Semitism. So such rhetorical... Uh, to let you know, two minutes. Ah, okay, so I will have to... Okay, so such rhetorical hijacking is precisely detrimental to the identification of anything that is or can actually be anti-Semitic. It is above all a matter of profound diversion of the thought and research of a post-colonial philosopher such as Membe, who in fact, as his last work is translated into English necropolitics proofs, in the philosophical, political, and methodological lineage of Franz Fanon, as I was taken care to underline similarities and correlation between racism and anti-Semitism. So uh, we can take the instance of uh, uh, Fanon's remarks in Black Skin, White Masks, where he's making the parallel between uh, uh, negrophobic uh, tendencies uh, coming from the French metropole and, and the, the kind of anti-Semitism uh, that was uh, very obviously uh, spoken out at that time. 
So Fanon's remarks on the powerful theoretical echo when Mende engages in a reflection on the nature of enmity on the powers of institutionalized state violence in economics as in politics, which are nothing but the power of death or of a life. And uh, so this, uh, Mende draws a parallel uh, in necropolitics in the same way as Fanon did at this time. Uh, what I would like to, to handle here, um, this is uh, how Membe's thinking is not only based on what he, he calls the Fanonian pharmacy. Uh, he actually more or less secretly proceeds to a whole series of weaving and dialogues. Uh, and this is uh, the last part uh, of my intervention. Uh, he's proceeding to a whole series of weaving and dialogues connecting with the structures and critical thoughts of authors and philosophers uh, such as Spinoza or Nietzsche seeking to understand in a structuralist manner the modernity and the deep nature of particular determinism of identity, politics and geopolitics, which not only in modernity have denied the so-called universalist ideals of the Enlightenment by claiming to serve them, but also by using discourse, language, speech as a pure tool of marketing or opaque communication, supposed to both vile and even distort the truth of political actions or of, of power itself. So this idea of an ontological unveiling, uh, therefore linked to the truth of being, but also to truth itself as a distinguishable phenomenon, as a historical materialist reality capable of being perceived, deciphered and evaluated for what it is in its legal and geopolitical forms and expression, is here in a way sacked by the affixing of a thought or statement carrying within, uh, within them a feeling of guilt linked to a deeply tragic historical reality and a traumatic memory fraught with consequences, which concerns all humanity. So this attack relayed by German political representatives belonging to the current Chancellor's Ordo Libero majority is not about thinking with or debating with a colonial and postcolonial thinker. By isolating two lines from the context of a reflection on the profound nature of necropolitics in the global postcolonial era that is ours, it is in retrospect a way of discrediting any attempt to decompartmentalize the history of Shola and the history of colonialism through their common necropolitical imprints, which can be found in modernity in the account of the second industrial revolution and the emergence of this era. Herein lies the idea of the thingification of the world and the living. And what emanates from these morbid expansions is a notion of power conceived from the angle of a power of domination and not the idea of a power, uh, in French we have a specific word, uh, um, which is puissance, which means a capacity. So a concept of power freely shared by different communities, which precisely seems to facilitate a real situation of peace, equity, and freedom in their establishment. In so I ask you to try to close. Uh, I, will try, I will try to close. So, so the last point I just wanted to make is that um, there is a dynamic at work also that connect in, um, in this critique and this way of of uh, returning uh, Membe's comment, but sends back to the sort of um, defamation that responds to a reversal of values and to a kind of resentment that were already also described by uh, Nietzsche. So, uh, and this comes uh, in his uh, genealogy of, uh, of morality. Uh, so uh, I will uh, just only say that, um, close with uh, the following, uh, statement is that um, uh, Membe's work tried to denounce precisely something that was already uh, strongly present in uh, uh, Franz Fanon's reflection on the profound nature of colonialism. And this is this concept of zone. And this concept of zone is of course has a very strong imaginary dimension. It has also very practical uh, uh, aspects that are connected to the practice of power in the way as uh, Michel Foucault was uh, 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 conceiving it. Uh, um, so uh, I guess that the, the critic that has been addressed uh, uh, to, to Membe proceeds like a denial of the common roots that may exist between uh, two dynamics of domination uh, uh, that are actually those of necropolitics and that connects two separate, apparently separate events, which are the colonial enterprises that emerge in uh, during the industrial era and and uh, and the event of the Holocaust in uh, in the 20th century. Thank you very much, Salim. Uh, thank you also, Liron. Um, both papers uh, brought us back into the controversy that 
brought us back, uh, that brought us together here. Uh, but interestingly, instead of refuting the accusations brought against Anshil Membe under their own terms, uh, Liron's and Salim's interventions allowed us to better understand really the epistemic origins of these accusations, what rendered them possible and what is in fact at stake here. Before we move on to the discussion, I just want to say a few closing words about the last two evenings, which we, the organizers, consider as a step on the way for other engagements, a suggestion regarding the possibility of a collaborating community that is aware of its institutional and political constraints. While thinking here with member, alongside member, all contributors made it clear that there is an urgent need to question our surroundings in the context of Palestine-Israel, a need that leads to rethinking incarceration, disease, space, time, comparison, images, punishment, survival, forced feeding, graves, and fertility. It is not a new need, but it is one that requires ever more tools, approaches, and, and, methodological, and methodologies, because starting with the question I raised yesterday concerning the dialectics of Israeli domination, and borrowing from members' claim regarding the desire for an enemy, the desire for apartheid, it is evident that within the different arguments and excuses supplied by Israel, often under the umbrella of security theology as termed by Nadira, there is a clear impossibility on Israel's part to not let go, an obsession that stands in strike in opposition, or perhaps as a possible explanation to Israel's military, political, and diplomatic advantages. The inability to let go while always under expansion or attempts at expansions clarifies that death is not an endpoint, nor is it a monolithic phenomenon or necessarily a private one. Clearly, in the current present, it is not enough to simply dictate who may live and who must die. This action alone cannot somehow satisfy the desire for ressentiment, a crucial concept that Salim brought in because it's a fictive sentiment that feeds itself and rests indifferent to its damaging effects. Maybe because, as Nitzan Tal showed, Israel's sovereignty is conditioned on the bodies of Palestinians, bodies it attempts to erase, but whose erasure risks its own existence. As we have seen, this desire for expansion, as Nitzan Leibovich indicated, is an act of exclusion, one that stands in opposition to an act of opening that allows inclusion. Language here is misleading because the expansion which should make more room is in, is in fact what leads to ever more carceral agents and bodies that blur the limit between the private and the national as Bruce showed. That is why it stands time and again against the calls to open gates, break walls and let ever more lives in. Thinking of members' work in light of the affair which led to our conversation, the attacks against him mark a clear use of equalizing powers in Iran's words, an attack that funnily enough had to await the English translation of Politique de la Animité in order to make its claims. The use of equalizing powers is not accidental. In fact, had the Zionist lobbies took the time to read through members' work more thoroughly, they could have grasped the real risk of his work, which could be summed up as a persistent call to let all lives in while rejecting the powers that deny life. If on the post-colony was an attempt to free Africa from the gaze that strangled it, an attempt at making Africa banal and universal, as Jean-Francois Bayard would say, Critique of Black Reason tried to think what comes after the demotion of Europe while paying attention to the compartmentalization of the world on a global scale. A crucial part in this process entailed the understanding that identity is a mutual belonging, not a relation between similar beings. 
Politique de la animitié on its part lies on the understanding that we have to make room for more species. Because as Mamba explains in Brutalism, we are experiencing the universalization of the black condition and of becoming black, a process that is dictated by eviction and evacuation of organic substances, among them us, obviously. In other words, whereas the new definition of anti-Semitism criminalizes the Palestinian struggle and any critique of Israel, while demanding that we think anti-Semitism in a vacuum, in a way which doesn't leave any room for solidarity, members' work marks an ongoing will to go against this tendency that seeks only the opening of markets. In that particular sense, the decision to list different events together while paying attention to their singular nature is what I consider the real threat to the order of things as we are experiencing them today. This event was surely an attempt at that direction that couldn't come about without the mutual belongings of identities. Thank you really everyone. Uh, I think uh, we didn't imagine how great this uh, symposium can be and it's all thanks to the presenters and the audience. Uh, so like Liron said, and I mentioned shortly in my words, I really hope that we will find a way to continue this conversation and perhaps use the COVID business uh, for our benefits for once. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Have a lovely evening. Uh, hope I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. And thank you for Academia for Equality that uh, really made it possible. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Bye, everyone.